Hello students, I am Dr. Ishita Sharma and in today's lecture, we are going to discuss the concepts of the test of reasonable forcibility and test of directness. Let's start with an introduction. In the law of torts, remoteness of damage is an interesting topic. Liabilities must be assigned once a wrongful act causes damage according to the general principle of law. But as many cases have shown, assigning liabilities is not always a simple task. Once a wrongful act has been committed in a tort, it can have multiple consequences. The consequences can have further consequences. These consequences of consequences can become a long chain and at times the problem of liability of the defendant comes up. The question that this particular topic deals with is how far can the defendant's liability be stretched for the consequences of consequences of the defendant's tort. Now to a first time reader as well as listener, this whole concept of consequences of consequences would sound confounding. Therefore, in order for us to appreciate the problem better, we may look at a simple example. In this simple example, we see that the defendant, who was a cyclist, negligently hits a pedestrian. Incidentally, the pedestrian happens to be carrying a bomb. And due to the negligence of the defendant, the pedestrian falls and the bomb explodes, resulting in the death of that pedestrian. Now, due to the explosion of the bomb, a nearby building catches fire and five of its residents die. The fire causes the building to collapse and destroys nearby structures, resulting in 20 more deaths. Further, the destruction of nearby shops results in pecuniary losses to the shop owners. Although one would tend to easily dismiss this example as too far-fetched, it is not difficult to see that similar cases resembling this particular domino effect can exist and that their existence can create questions of legal importance. In the above example, the defendant's tort of negligence can result in unintended consequences that were neither intended nor comprehended beforehand. Such a situation creates questions for assigning blame. Even if the court were of the opinion that the defendant was to be blamed for the death of the pedestrian, would the court also unhesitatingly place the same amount of blame on the defendant for the deaths of those other 25 people? Lord Wright also explains the problem. To some extent, in the case of Lisbosch Dredger versus S.S. Edison, the law cannot take account of everything that follows a wrongful act. It regards some subsequent matters as outside the scope of its selection because it is infinite of the law to judge the cons causes of causes or consequences of consequences. In the varied web of affairs, the law must abstract some consequences as relevant not perhaps on grounds of pure logic, but simply for practical reasons. To answer such questions, jurists propose that a defendant should be made responsible only for the proximate and not remote consequences of the defendant's wrongful act. Proximate damage and remote damage. Just as Lord Wright has pointed out, we have to draw a line for practical purposes. Now, the question that arises is, where exactly is this line to be drawn? To answer this question, we look at a test known as the test of remoteness. With this test, we check if the damage is too remote a consequence of the wrongful act or not. Let us see this through judicial instances. Scott v. Shefford, 1773, the Squibb case. In this case, a person named A 
threw a lighted squib into a crowd. The squib fell on person B. B, in order to prevent injury to himself, threw that squib further. It landed on another person C, who in turn threw it further. And it finally exploded on a person D, thereby injuring him. As a result of this explosion, D lost one of his eyes. In this case, A was held liable for D. Although one would say that his act was the farthest from the injury to D, his act was held to be a proximate cause of the injury to D. Haynes vs. Harwood, 1935 In this historically famous case, the servants of the defendant, owing to their negligence, abandoned a horse van on a crowded street. The street had children and women. Some children pelted stones at the horses, as a result of which the horses bolted and started posing a threat to the safety of the people in the street. In order to stop the horses and to rescue the women and children, a policeman, who is the plaintiff here, suffered injuries himself. In a lawsuit brought by the plaintiff against the defendant, one defence pleaded was that of novus actus intervenience, means remoteness of consequences. Again, in this case, the court held that novus actus intervenience was not a valid defence and that the negligent act of the defendant's servants leaving the horse van unattended was the proximate cause of the injury suffered by the plaintiff. Lynch v. Nerdin, 1841 This case is similar to the previous one to a certain degree. Here, the defendant left his horse cart unattended on a road. Some children began playing with the horse cart. One child sat on the cart, who is the plaintiff, and another set the horse in motion. Consequently, the child suffered damage and action was taken. In this case too, the defence of novus actus intervenience was pleaded. But again, it was held by the court that the injury to the plaintiff was a proximate consequence of the defendant's act and hence he would be held liable to the plaintiff. Now two tests of remoteness. Now that we have seen that the law deems a person liable for the injuries caused that were proximate consequences of that person's act, one might ask about the parameters on which the court decides which act is a proximate one and which one is remote. To answer this question, we see two tests of remoteness during the course of legal history. The first one, test of reasonable foresight. Second, test of directness. Test of reasonable foresight. Claimants seeking to establish liability for property damage must prove that the defendant reasonably foresaw the sustained damage. The law relating to reasonable forcibility requires the court to apply an objective test to determine what ought to have been known by a reasonable person in the defendant's position. In the cases of Khan versus London Borough of Harrow and Helen Sheila Kane in 2013, the claimants owned a property in Stanmore, Middlesex, which contained a well-established oak tree. The second defendant owned the neighbouring property, which contained a large Lawson cypress hedge, half a metre from the claimant's property and a substantial oak tree, that is the trees over here. The claimants first noticed damage to their property in September 2006. Their insurers instructed loss adjusters who began a number of investigations. In 2007 and 2008, the loss adjusters tried to notify the second defendant of the damage, but the correspondence was incorrectly addressed and they did not receive a notice until June 2009. The second defendant accepted that the trees had caused or contributed to subsidence damage to the claimant's property. However, 
she denied that the damage was reasonably foreseeable to her as an ordinary private owner of an individual residential property. The key issue before the court was to decide if the damage was reasonably foreseeable and in particular whether Mrs. Kane as an individual residential owner knew or ought to have known about the risk of damage. The judge considered the evidence and the issue of forcibility. He found that the correct test was an objective test of what the second defendant ought to have known as a reasonably prudent landowner with trees on her property rather than what she actually knew. Although the second defendant did not have actual knowledge about the risk of damage that the trees posed to the claimant's property, the relevant person was a reasonably prudent landowner who would have been aware of the real risk of damage from the hedge due to its height and proximity to claimant's property. However, the judge also found that it would have been reasonable for the claimants to have communicated the risk of damage and actual damage to the second defendant. On this basis, the claim was reduced by 15% for contributory negligence. According to this test, if a reasonable man could have foreseen the consequences of a wrongful act, they are not too remote. Pollock was an advocate of this test of remoteness. He opined in Rigby v. Hewitt and Greenland v. Chaplin that the liability of the defendant is only for those consequences which could have been foreseen by a reasonable man placed in the circumstances of the wrongdoer. But here we must note that it would not be a sufficient defence in itself to say that the defendant did not foresee the consequences. The court would decide whether the defendant should have foreseen the consequence based on the standards of reasonability. This test of reasonable foresight lost its popularity to the test of directness. But, as we shall see later, it managed to regain currency among jurists. Test of directness According to the test of directness, a person is liable for all the direct consequences of his act, whether he could have foreseen them or not, because the consequences that directly follow a wrongful act are not too remote. Further, according to this test, if the defendant could foresee any damage, he would be liable for all the direct consequences of his wrongful act. To understand this particular test of remoteness better, it would be suffice to look at the Ray Polemis case. Ray Polemis and Furness with the and Company, 1921. This case, popularly referred to as the Ray Polemis case, was the landmark case on the test of directness. The courts of appeal held the test of reasonable foresight to be the relevant test. Whereas later, the Privy Council upheld the test of directness. The relevant facts of the case are that the defendants chartered a ship to carry cargo. The cargo included a quantity of petrol and benzene in tins. Now there was a leakage in the tins and some oil was collected in the hold of the ship. Now owing to the defendant's negligence and his servants, a plank fell in the hold and consequently sparks were generated. The sparks caused the ship to be completely destroyed by fire. The Privy Council held the owners of the ship entitled to recover the loss even though the defendants could not have forcibly seen such a loss. It was held that since the fire and the subsequent destruction of the ship was a direct consequence of the defendant's negligence, it was immaterial whether the defendant could have reasonably foreseen it or not. As per L. G. Scruton, once an act is negligent, the fact that its exact operation was not foreseen is immaterial. Wagon Mound Case, 1961, Test of Reasonable Foresight Revisited The Privy Council rejected the directness test 
upheld in the Repolemis case 40 years later in the case of Overseas Tank Ship UK Limited versus Moth's Dock and Engineering Company Limited, also known as the Wagon Mount case. The Wagon Mount was a ship that was chartered by the appellants, that is Overseas Tank Ship Limited. It was taking fuel at a Sydney port at a distance of about 180 meters from the respondent's wharf. The wharf had some welding operations going on. Owing to the negligence of the appellant's servant, a large quantity of oil was spilt on the sea, which also reached the respondent's wharf. Due to the welding operations going on there, molten metal from the respondent's wharf fell, which ignited the fuel oil and caused a fire. The fire caused a lot of damage to the respondent's wharf and equipment. In this case, the trial court and the Supreme Court held the appellants liable for the damage to respondents based on the ruling in Repolemis. But when the case reached the Privy Council, it was held that Repolemis could not be considered good law any further, and thus the decision of the Supreme Court was reversed. The Privy Council held that the appellants could not have reasonably foreseen the damage to the respondent, thus absolving them of liability for the damage caused. In the case, Lord Viscount Simmons observed, it does not seem consonant with current ideas of justice or morality that for an act of negligence, the actor should be liable for all consequences, however unforeseeable. They also maintained that according to the principles of civil liability, a man must be considered to be responsible only for the probable consequences of his act. And therefore, in this case, the test of reasonable foresight regained its authority to determine the remoteness of damage and subsequently the liability of a person for the damage caused by him in cases of tort. Hughes v. Lord Advocate, 1963 In this case, Workers employed by the post office left a manhole in the road unattended. Before they left the site, they covered the manhole with a tarpaulin entrance and placed several paraffin lamps around it. Attracted by the lamps, the eight-year-old plaintiff played around the manhole with another child. Someone knocked down one of the lamps, causing an explosion in the manhole. The explosion resulted in damage to the plaintiff. In this case, the court held that even though the explosion was not foreseeable by the servants of the post office, the type of damage that is burns was. Therefore, the defendants were held liable. Doty v. Turner Manufacturing Company Limited, 1964. The defendant employing the plaintiff in this case, owing to the negligence of other workmen employed by the defendant, an asbestos cover slipped into a cauldron of molten hot liquid. The resulting explosion caused injuries to the plaintiff who was standing nearby. It was held that the damage that resulted from the explosion was not such that it could have been reasonably foreseen by the defendant. And therefore, the defendant's negligence was not a proximate cause of the damage to the plaintiff the defendants were held not liable. SCM UK Limited v. W.J. Whittle & Sons, 1971 The Court of Appeals applied the test of reasonable foreseeability in this case. In this case, due to the defendant's worker's negligence, an electric cable was damaged. As a result of this damage, a long power failure followed in the plaintiff's typewriter factory. Consequently, as a result of this power failure, the plaintiff alleged that there had been a loss of production and damage to his factory's machines. The court in this case held that the defendants were aware of the fact that the said electric cable was used to supply power to the plaintiff's factory and that they could have reasonably foreseen that any such power failure would lead to significant loss to the plaintiff. Therefore, the plaintiff was entitled to damages. The 
concept of forcibility or expectability of certain harms from certain types of conduct crystallizes the most powerful and most uniform social policy in the various rules and doctrines of tort law. The whole idea of risk or threat is comprehended in the notion of foresight in the sense of the probability of harm resulting from the conduct. Experience suggests the danger of certain activities, not particular experience of particular individuals, but general experience, experience that often defies analysis, the multitude of factors, knowledge, hunches, instincts, or what they may be called, the common sense that makes social intercourse possible, all operate to prompt the ordinary, reasonable man that harms are probable or natural as normal results of certain situations and certain conduct. The anticipation of harm raises the problem of legal responsibility. Anticipation of harm, of course, is by no means the only factor involved. Other aspects of social policy find crystallization in other doctrinal developments. Even where the actor has created risks, that is, has conducted himself in such a way as to probably injure others, legal liability may be wanted. Perhaps the injured party participated in the creation of the risk. Perhaps he agreed either to the creation of the risk or to the actual injury. Perhaps the creation of the risk by the actor, although threatening forcible harm, was made under circumstances that for reasons of social policy, the law regards as privileged. Perhaps the actual harm was privileged or perhaps the risk created, although it threatened foreseeable harm, was not on the whole unreasonable. Each of these policies outlined find its counterpart in a series of complicated rules of law, the effect of which may be to insulate the actor from liability for the creation of a situation that contains the potential for probable harm to others. But the forcibility factor is essential to liability. Somewhere in the sequence of happenings, a defendant has acted in a manner that threatens others or there will be no liability. In other words, a person cannot be held legally responsible solely because the harm caused was foreseeable. Liability only arises if the harm was to some extent foreseeable. Therefore, a major principle of the law of torts is that liability exists only if the harm produced was in some measure foreseeable. Now coming on to the conclusion, the application of the test of foreseeability, however, requires a rather nice analysis. Harm may be foreseeable in several senses and much confusion is to be found in the cases resulting from a sloppy use of the idea. In the first place, the particular injury or damage may be foreseeable in the sense that not only the exact person injured was foreseen to have been exposed to the risk, but the precise manner in which the injury happened was to be reasonably apprehended. Again, while the exact way in which the injury occurred may not be forcible, the general type of injury may be reasonably forcible, as well as the general class of persons threatened. Although it is by no means necessary that the precise sequence of events be the subject of reasonable foresight, it is necessary that the general sort of interest invaded and the general class of persons injured be foreseeable before there can be legal liability. The former question is a problem of legal causation and the forcibility of the precise sequence of happenings is not always essential to liability. But the latter two questions go to distinctly different problems, namely the character of the conduct upon which legal liability shall be predicated and it is submitted that legal liability is never predicated upon conduct which did not threaten 
the general type of injury complained of to the general class of persons injured in the sense that some such injury to some such persons could be foreseen as probable indeed this analysis cannot operate automatically or mechanically it cannot serve as a substitute for the exercise of the judgment forming faculties the concept is an elastic one it may to use justice cardozo's phrase expand or shrink the general type of harm and the general class of persons threatened quite obviously must include or exclude many situations today that were outside or within their purview yesterday experience and particular aspects of social life will determine the scope and range of such concepts and circumstances will always affect their applicability there is however value to be derived from such an analysis it reveals a great and uniform principle of policy the policy to confine legal liability in tort to situations in which a man's conduct created some foreseeable danger to a foreseeable part of society unless his conduct can be characterized in such a way it is never a basis for legal responsibility with this we come to the end of today's lecture thank you very much